Hello and welcome guys. In this video we're going to go over every electrical component that Rust has to offer us. I'll be going into detail on how each component functions, other little details you need to know, and what each component is used for. If you find this video helpful, I'd love to hear it from you in the comments. And with that out of the way, let's get started. Alright, so our first source of power in Rust is going to be the wind turbine. The wind turbine will produce a constant source of energy as long as they're pre placed correctly. They work by letting the wind push the blades, and they output energy. I've generally seen a, a wind turbine produce over 50 energy, and they can produce up to 150 energy in the right circumstances. That rarely happens, by the way. The wind is constantly changing speed, and so you want to have a leeway of about 50 energy. Because if you, if you have something that needs more than 50 energy, uh, you might lose power sometimes, but generally I never see it dip down to 50 ever. It usually hangs around 75 or higher. Now, be careful where you place the wind turbine. If you place them too close to structures and the wind turbine is below the structure that is blocking it, it may block the wind and stop the wind turbine from producing energy whatsoever. It's like this, it's not rotating and it's outputting zero power. Also, I have a little example here, you cannot place walls around wind turbines to protect them. This will block all wind from reaching this turbine and it outputs zero. So in general, you need to keep them exposed. It's not, depending on what server you're on, it's not too risky. Uh, it does take two rockets to destroy these things, so they are pretty sturdy, but it's good to have a backup source of energy with solar panels or backup batteries. Our second main source of energy is going to come from solar panels. Solar panels work by using sunlight to produce energy, so they will only work during the day, and they will be less efficient during foggy days. Now, I've noticed something weird about solar panels. Even if you place them directly towards the sun, like this solar panel I have here, it doesn't output the maximum of 20 energy. I think this is because that the sun doesn't dictate whether the, the solar panel produces its energy or not. As long as it's during the day and sunlight is hitting it, not necessarily uh, directly from the sun, but as long as sunlight is hitting it, it will produce energy and I think the direction of the solar panel is what affects it more during the day because as you can see this solar panel is facing towards the east which is not directly in front of the sun and this produces the maximum output of 20 energy same thing with the solar panels you have facing towards the west to get sun that has uh, begun setting this solar panel is not facing the sun at all whatsoever and because it's facing southwest, where the sun would generally set, it is outputting 20. So I think that solar panels are rigged to produce sunlight during the day, and as long as they're not in the shade, they need to be facing east and southwest to produce the maximum amount of energy. I'm not sure if it varies from server to server, because I have noticed that the sun doesn't always rise in the same spot, and it can really change depending on if you're hopping to a different server where it's a different time of day and the clock is different on that server it's going to need some experimenting and if you guys have any idea on this uh, as to why this may be go ahead and leave a comment for me with power sources taken care of we can go over how to store power when it comes to storing power and rust we have two options we can use the small rechargeable battery or the large rechargeable battery the small rechargeable battery has a maximum life of up to 15 minutes. This means you can power something with it for up to 15 minutes. It also has a maximum output of 10 watts. This means that you could power, let's say, 10 lights with it. Uh, if you want to power 11, it's not going to work because its maximum output is 10 watts and each light consumes 1 watt of power. If you want to do something bigger or need more charge time, you'll have to fall back to the large rechargeable battery. This has a maximum life of 4 hours, and it has a maximum output of 100 watts. This means you could potentially power 100 lights for 4 hours using this battery before it dies. 
Um, that being said, it also needs 100 watts of input energy to charge most efficiently. You can charge it with less than 100 watts, but the less power that goes into it, the slower it's going to charge. Closer to 100, the faster, closer to zero, the slower. Same thing with the small rechargeable battery. Its output is 10, so its input is going to have to be at, uh, up to 10. It won't take anything more than 10, but the closer it is to 10, the faster this is going to charge. The closer it is to zero, the slower it's going to charge. Also, I need to bring this up because I had some issues with this before, uh, learning electricity and implementing it. You cannot have power going into a battery to charge it and have the battery outputting energy to power something at the same time. Batteries charge at 80% efficiency, so it's always going to be outputting more energy than what is charging it. So it will drain slower, but your battery will eventually die and it will interfere with the powering of your base. So be careful with that. You'll have to set up some, uh, some ways to block power output, which I'll go over in another video. But yeah, and uh, also be careful with the way you place these large batteries because watch I'll put one down right now there is no way to rotate them using the R key and they do place backwards um, so when you place it down the inputs and outputs of this battery are gonna be on the back you can detect through the battery so you can still reach the inputs and outputs through the battery it is tedious and depending on the mobility that you have inside your base it might be quite difficult to access these points so just keep that in mind when you place these large batteries I do prefer them they are good just watch out for that because I find this really annoying but Facebook has said that they are gonna be fixing this and we will have a way to rotate these batteries soon so that's good with power taken care of we can now start going over components the first component I'll be going over is the root combiner, being as it's the most simple. The root combiner works by combining power outputs of power sources. This means that if I need more energy output to let's say charge a battery or a system, I can connect multiple power sources to combine all of their energy output into one. As we can see, this solar panel has an output of 20 and I might need more than 20 power to let's say charge my battery and power other things I want to power so we can place multiple power sources like wind turbines or solar panels and mix and match them all and combine them all into one big power output in this example I have multiple solar panels all linked together so each individual power output will be combined into one which in this case I get 131 power output so this is a way to combine power using these things. Um, I do have this, for example, powering light. We have 131 power going into light, and then we can branch this out and power more things if we wanted to. Do be careful though, do not use root combiners to combine batteries. They will combine the power output of the batteries, but the battery will not, will not charge. Like I said earlier, if you power anything with a battery while it's charging, the battery will not charge. It will always lose power and it will die eventually. So right now, as you can see, I have two solar panels with a root combiner leading in to the power input of the battery. So this is charging via this method. Now, if I connect this to a root combiner, the root combiner consumes no energy. So the description says, but as we can see, I'm losing charge from this battery. I hope they fix this because this is kind of tedious. We don't really have a method of combining sources that aren't directly power sources. We have no way to combine uh, outputs uh, from batteries or other components. So it's kind of something we have to work around for the time being unless they fix that. Um, so yeah, do not combine batteries with the root combiner, but feel free to combine them with power sources they will not they will not interfere with the outputs of the power sources at all whatsoever so now i'm going to go over the door controller the door controller works just exactly how you would think it would so to place it down you're going to place it nice and close to a door and then you're going to pair it now if you do have a lock a key lock or a code lock you're going to have to unlock it first and then as you can see we can pair it 
when that turns green, you know the the door controller is paired to its its parent door. Go ahead and lock it now. Now for this to work in this example, we are going to apply power to the door controller. So right now I have it hooked up to a basic switch from a power source. And so when we activate the switch, the door will open. Now it will stay open until the the door controller stops receiving power, so this will stay open indefinitely. Now to close it, we would have to turn off the switch. If you're going to use this method, be careful, be mindful that it will leave your door open until you turn it off. The second common way of opening and closing doors, much more convenient and safe than this regular switch, is the timer. Now the timer works by activating, and whatever time you give it, it will stay active that long and then cut power. So right now I have it set to two seconds. It's a really good method for an auto door closer. You can set it to whatever time. Right now, like I said, I have it set to two, but you could set it to five if you wanted, and this door will stay open until five, uh, four or five seconds. Wait for it, come on, there it is, cool. Now, another method of using a door controller is the pressure plate. I don't recommend using a pressure plate because randoms can use it. If somebody happens to get in your base or something, the they can uh, they can get out for free, even if there's a code lock on your door. You just step on it and the door opens. You can, however, use this for a trap base if you wanted to. A rug will fit over this. A bear rug is a really common method of hiding this thing. So if you want a a pressure plate to trigger a trap, it is not a bad idea. But as for a convenient door and door opening and door closing method, don't use this. Only use this for other things or uh, in terms of like trap bases and stuff. Next we have the splitter. The splitter lets you take one power line and divide its power into three separate power lines. So right now I have a generator which outputs 100 power. Now this 100 power is going to get split up into three different outputs that get split equally among the three. So I know it says 99 right now, that's because it takes the, uh, the splitter it consumes one unit of energy and then divides the rest into three equal areas. So now when I take this and output it into a light, it powers. I can do the same thing here. And this will power. I can apply it to this light and this will power. This is convenient if you need to separate uh, separate power lines. If you only have one, you can separate it into three different ones. Now I know you can just chain lights together. Um, that would be the easier thing to do in this case, but I'm just explaining how to use the splitter, what it does. Now you can use more splitters to s create more outputs. So for example, if we take this splitter and plug it this into different splitters we now have nine outputs but because 33 or uh, because each output of this is 33 because 99 divided by 3 is 33 each splitter is receiving 33 power and then is dividing that 33 power into three outputs minus one because it consumes one power to be used now I know it seems good, it is actually in most cases not a good idea to do this because you're wasting a lot of power by doing this. Because now each output in this one, because it's splitting 99, each output is 33. And now you're dividing 33 power again. So unless you're powering, for some weird case, a bunch of things that only need one power that can't be chained together, it is not a good idea to do this because in many cases you can just chain things together or divide power in other ways. Um, sometimes it is convenient to use the splitter but that's completely up to you. Alright so the next component is the electrical branch. What the branch does is that it lets you take one line and split it into two. So it is similar to the splitter except that one divides it into three but what's special about the branch is that if you plug a line into it like this 100, uh, 100 units of power going into it, you could output this into a battery, and you could output this into a light. 
Now what's special about the branch is that whatever value you configure it to, like right now I have it set to 10, the branch outside is going to push 10, uh, 10 electricity out, 10 units of power that is going to go and charge this battery. We could set this value to whatever we want. We could send it. We could set it to 12 if we wanted to, even though this can't accept more than 10. But now, this side is going to take in 100. The branch is going to consume one power, and the branch is going to shove 12 units of power out the branch side and send the rest down the main power out. Whereas this light is now receiving 87 power. Now, if we change it back to like let's say two. It's going to receive 97 power and the battery is going to receive 2. Now the branch cannot be set below the value 2. You cannot set, you cannot set it to 1 or 0. It does not work. The lowest value is 2. So if you're not planning to use 2 out the side and you can make use of just one line, you could do that. But this is a much more efficient way to split power rather than using a splitter. Splitters tend to waste power if power inputs or uh, if the power outputs aren't divided by 3, it's always going to round down until it gets a number divisible by 3, and so you're wasting power that way. The branch you can control, it doesn't, it doesn't waste power, it only consumes 1, so it's much more flexible. And just like the splitters, you can chain them together. And just like this, if I wanted to make a power main power out going to here, keep this going to the battery, make this go to the light, and have this power, let's see, I don't know, a different light. Totally works, and you're not wasting power with the splitter. Now we have the blocker. The blocker is interesting. The blocker will transfer power completely normally. It has a power in, it has a power out, and it has a block pass through. This is the interesting part of the blocker. Now if you just have power in and power out, it's going to transfer that power completely normally. The blocker will consume one power to activate itself. But what's interesting about this is that if you plug power directly into the block pass through, the power will cut and it will stop emitting power. Now, this could also work if you plugged it into, let's say, a switch and plugged this into the block pass through to activate the switch and the blocker gets cut because the block pass through is receiving power from the switch. Now if you turn the switch off, power is then reopened and is powering the light again. Now even though there is a line in the block pass through, it doesn't matter because no power is being sent through the line. The block pass through will only trigger if there's actual power being sent to it, like so. Next we have the OR switch. The OR switch has an input A, an input B, and a power out. Now, the, what the OR switch does is that it can accept two inputs, but it will only output the greater of the two uh, power inputs. So for example, the solar panel is producing 20 units of energy. If I go ahead and activate the switch to let its power go into the OR switch, it's going to output the 18. That's because the switch uses one power and the OR switch uses one power. So 20 minus 2 is 18. That 18 is going to go to the light. Now, same thing is going to happen with the generator. It outputs 100, so 98 is going to come out the top and go to the light. But watch what happens. We're going to have the 18 from the solar panel, and we're going to send in the 100 from the generator, and only 98 is going to be outputted. Now the switch is completely normal. It's it's not gonna it's not gonna block anything. It's just gonna let power through, but it's only going to accept the greater of the two inputs. Now we have the AND switch. The AND switch is similar to the OR switch, except its properties are slightly different. It has an input A and an input B, and has a power out just like the OR switch. What the AND switch does is that it will only send out power if both input A and B are receiving power. So I'll activate one switch to send power to A, and it is receiving the power, as we can see by that green light, but it's not outputting any power yet. Same thing if I activate B. It's receiving B side, but it's not outputting any power to the light. Only when both A and B are receiving power does the AND switch 
open up and send power out as we can see by the light turning on. The XOR switch is similar to the AND switch and the OR switch. It has an input A, an input B, and a power out, but the XOR switch will only let through one input at a time. If it is receiving power from both A and B, it will block power. As we can see from this, power is being sent from the generator out the, the XOR switch into the light. Same thing if we do the B side. Power is being sent in through B and sent out through the power out into the light. Only when it is receiving power from both A and B does the XOR switch block and stop sending power. So it is basically a different type of blocker. The RAN switch is its a funny little switch. Um, it's a little gate that when powered will send power out normally, but if you send if you send power to the set side, it'll actually only have a 50-50 chance of sending out power. So it's kind of like a, the RAN stands for random. So it randomly sends power and it randomly blocks, just like that. Um, it's not completely random. It, the odds are 50-50, so there's a 50% chance of it not sending power and a 50% chance of it sending power. My luck is fucking terrible. There we go. <laughs> Here we have the memory cell. The memory cell is interesting. It has a power in, and it has the inverted output, and a normal output. It has a set, it has a reset, and it has a toggle. Now, what it does is that when power is being sent through it, it's either going to send power down the inverted output, or send it down the normal output depending on what state it's in. Right now it's on an inverted state so it's going to send power down the inverted side to this light. Now we can change states by hitting the toggle switch and now it's going to toggle the memory cell and switch sides. Now it's going to the normal output. The toggle lets you change whenever it is triggered so that's what the toggle side does. The reset side, which I have connected to the center switch, will always reset it back to its inverted state. Now the set side will always set it back to its, its uh, normal output state. Now if we were to hit toggle again, it'll just switch over and over as long as the toggle is being triggered. Reset, we'll reset it back. Hitting reset while it's in the uh, the inverted state won't do anything because this is its normal state. Now the set state will always put it back into its nor into uh, the normal output state. No matter how many times it's triggered, it won't change. The only one that will change it over and over, no matter what, is the toggle switch. The other two, this the um, the reset and the set, will always change it back to its respective states depending on which one you trigger. The HBHF sensor, or the heartbeat sensor I like to call it, detects players that are nearby it. So watch what happens when I step away from the heartbeat sensor, breaking its line of sight with me. The door shuts. This is because I have the heartbeat sensor outputting energy to a door controller, so when it detects a player, it will open the door. It has a 20 meter uh, range, so you can see that when I'm far away, the door closes because it's not detecting me anymore. But as I inch my way closer, we can really get an idea of just how far 20 meters is. Right about here. So it's quite a fair distance. It has a couple of settings. Uh, you can choose to exclude authorized players, which means that it will not detect players that are authorized on your TC. And you can choose to exclude others, which will exclude non-building authorized players. So if I exclude authorized players, because I'm authorized on my TC, it will not detect me anymore, but it will detect people that are not authorized on the TC. If I choose to include authorized players again, it'll then detect me. And then I can choose to exclude authorized players. So now, oh no. <laughs>
I have the dumb. Include authorized, and then I can choose to exclude others. This means that people not authorized on the TC will not be able to trigger this. And so, in this case, if a stranger were to be right here and I were to be outside line of sight, the door would shut because the heartbeat sensor no longer likes uh, people that are not authorized on your TC. Do keep in mind that the heartbeat sensor only outputs one power. If you have 100 power going into it like I do, it's only going to output one. So it has enough energy to power this door controller and nothing else. You can't even power other heartbeat sensors. You can't change them together. You can't chain them together or anything. So you need to wire accordingly to fit that, uh, that property of the heartbeat sensor. So that's every electrical component that Rust has to offer. I hope I was able to help you learn all these components. I know it took me hours of experimentation to get comfortable with it all. If you would like any in-depth guide on any real-world applications of any of these components or help with an electrical design you might have, leave me a comment and I'd be more than happy to help you. If this video did help you, be sure to give it that thumbs up and subscribe for future Rust videos. Stay rusty, my friends.